Welcome, welcome to our We Are Family celebration. When it's the fifth Sunday of the month, we combine our 10 a.m. and 11.30 uh, congregations, and we have this service together, which is just lovely. It's lovely to see you. Some families are away for half term, but it's lovely that you are here with us today. Today we're going to continue looking at the story of Joseph, and we'll be thinking particularly about reconciliation and reunion from that story. And Norman will be speaking to us a little bit later on, which we look forward to. And uh, we'll also be having an update from our Eagle team as we uh, just replay and rethink our commitment to caring for God's uh, creation, what we're doing as a church, what we're doing as families and individuals. So the uh, Eco team will be helping us think that through a little bit later. But as we begin, I was made aware on the way in that it was somebody's birthday this week, somebody's 68. Tom, happy birthday to you. I was wondering, has anyone else had any birthdays this week? Or it's very close, six weeks now, isn't it? We get there and when we do, we'll sing really heartily for you. Is there anyone else who's got a birthday this week or in the last couple of weeks? Have you? Well, I'm not sure that you have had, but what we'll do is we'll sing happy birthday to Tom and if you have had birthdays, we'll include you in it. But let's sing happy birthday to Tom. Happy birthday. I'm afraid that we've got no musicians, so there's a note. Happy birthday. having you here brother it's great to have you and uh, as Tom rightly reminded us here the principal reason why we're here is because of God and for God so as we begin let's stand together and let's use the words on the screen we're going to remind ourselves of the promises that are ours in God so that's how we're going to call each other to worship in just a moment the Lord be with you Grace and peace to you from God our Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. Who loves us so much that he calls us his own children. Who has prepared an inheritance for us that will never spoil or fade. who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. So let's worship God together and if you're able, please stay standing. And we're going to sing about God's goodness in the words of Great is Thy Faithfulness.
to God and today we focus our prayers on the ways in which we fail to reflect God in our relationships with each other. So let's pray. Loving God, you have reconciled us in Christ Jesus and have given us the ministry of reconciliation. We pray for all those from whom we are estranged, bring healing to strained or broken relationships. Forgive us for the times we have wronged others, whether by ignorance, neglect, or intention. Grant us the courage and the grace to seek forgiveness and opportunity to make amends. Where others have wronged us, grant us a gracious spirit that we might forgive even as we have forgiven. In Jesus Christ. Amen. And even though we're not sharing communion together this morning, it seems fitting after those prayers to take time to share peace with one another. We remember that Jesus was prepared to die in order to make peace with us. And that in a world which we know too well is torn by division, we symbolize our unity by sharing the peace. And we determine together by sharing the peace to make every effort to maintain the bond of peace. So let's stand together. And we say together we are. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. If you're visiting with us, we just move around and we shake each other by the hand and we say, the peace of the Lord be with you. Young and old, let's greet each other now. Peace, guys. Let's move back to our seats and we will remain standing. So if we go back to our positions, but we'll remain standing. We're going to continue in worship as we sing of the one who forgives us and who reconciles us to God and to each other. Let's sing out together.
We are here for you To you our hearts are open Nothing here is hidden You are our one desire You alone are holy Only you are worthy God let your fire fall down Let us shine your anthem, your renown, the disguise, we are here for you. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing here is hidden. You are our desire. You alone are holy. So Helen's going to come and she's going to share a wee bit about that and excite us for what's next as well. So let's uh, listen in. Hi everyone. Um, for anyone who I haven't met before, my name's Helen and I lead the Eco Committee here. Um, so over the last few months, hopefully you will have seen our phenomenal pollinators patch. I should have thought of a better alliterative um, adjective. I don't know. Um, yeah, anyway, can't do it. Um, but you will have seen our pollinators patch um, just between the car park and the back of the church building. So I hope that you have enjoyed seeing that, seeing it develop, seeing it bloom. And Helen Newitt is the person who has been kind of coordinating that. Um, so our definite thanks to her. Um, and loads of volunteers, lots of you got involved in that, helping to dig and to plant and to water especially. So thank you so much for everyone playing a kind of part in that. Um, Helen has really thought it through, so there should be things in bloom all through the year. So um, you'll now have seen that there's a bench that we got as part of the grant that enabled us to do the pollinators patch from Live Here, Love Here. Um, and the bench is designed for you to sit on and enjoy the pollinators at work. So please do feel free to do that anytime that, that's, that suits you. 
really. Um, so um, meet friends for a coffee there or whatever you want to do. Um, but it's there for you to enjoy. Um, the last part of our application um, for that grant, the Live Here, Love Here grant, was to plant some fruit trees. They are now ordered. If you need to know anything about fruit trees, especially Irish varieties, I can talk to you about that. Um, probably with regurgitating things I've heard, but whatever. Um, and they are going to be planted either side of the scout hut, right at the back of our property. Um, and I've ordered four apple trees, two pear trees, a plum tree and a damson tree, um, as well as some fruit bushes. And I, on my list is some rhubarb crowns, unless someone's got some, they are looking to move on. Um, so they will be planted in the next number of weeks. So I may be looking for some strong people, it's not restricted to just men, um, to dig some holes and um, do the necessary to plant those trees. Um, we are continuing with the, the carbon footprint audit um, for our church and for our buildings and for our land. Um, that's been taken a bit longer than we had expected, but it, it does continue. Um, Helen and Christine and Nikki, could you come and lift one of these three bins? Because the other thing that we have done in this quarter is we've got these bins, so if you could bring them and bring, hold them up. I know this is a glamorous part of being part of the committee, of course. But these are the new bins that are in the hall's kitchen. I know, great, it's like Wheel of Fortune or something. Um, so, Helen has the turquoise bin, and that is the recycling bin. So, plastics like empty juice or sauce bottles, paper, cardboard, tin cans. I make sure the items that you put in that are clean. Nice, I like it. Um, so, really, it's anything that you would put in your, blue, your big blue bin at home can go in the turquoise. In the white bin that Nikki is holding, this is for food waste, so leftover food from events or committees or those biscuits that have now finally you're admitting they're stale um, should go in there. Used tea bags, filtered coffee grounds, etc. It will have a bag in and we'll make it really clear where the bags are to that. Um, so that's where that goes in. And black, if it can't, it only goes in the black bin if it can't go in the turquoise or the white bin. So hopefully that is going to help us to all be on one page for that and we'll make sure that there's a list, thank you guys, a list attached to the bins. So see me or one of the committee if you have further questions. But hopefully, glass can't go in that, so we need to, I think probably next will be, I think for now, leave the glass and anything that you know can be recycled on the side and we'll ask Billy to do our caretaker to do some of that. It's riveting stuff, I know. Okay, please do take one of these um, updates that we've spent time putting together. It has some, um, an invitation to do one thing in this quarter, and we have really focused on how you can save energy um, in your home and in your um, kitchen. So there's lots of advice there. Um, there's a jargon buster. There's some film recommendations for all the family, including one of our favorites, the Lorax, um, and a spot the difference activity. So please do put our efforts to good use. Um, if you want to chat about anything um, eco-related, we absolutely don't claim to know everything, but we want to kind of champion this work in our church. So if you ever want to chat about what that could look like in your group or something that you're involved in, please let us know. Thank you so much. Great stuff, Helen, and thank you, and thank you, the Eco Team. It's very exciting to see the changes to our church site, and hopefully the changes to our behaviours as well that are happening as a result of um, the encouragement given by our Eco Team. So thank you. All right, little ones, it's time for you to go out to your groups to crash and the Sunday school, but just wait until your leaders are ready, and they'll bring you out. So Sunday school age children out here, and crash age children out to your left. And as they head out, the rest of us are going to stand and we're going to continue in worship as we sing a couple of songs. So let's stand and sing together.
by your grace so free. that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's continue in worship. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He stumbled himself, and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah name of all Messiah, Lord of all. His 
body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing. situation in Israel Gaza and also as we remember that the war continues in Ukraine and in other flashpoints across the world I hope that we are faithful in praying for these situations and we don't just spectate and shake our heads and say isn't it a shame but that we keep asking God for mercy and we keep asking God the Prince of Peace to intervene in these places so let's be faithful in doing that and we're going to do that now and uh, you'll see that the prayer is responsive. Let's pray. Dear God, we cry out to you on behalf of the people seriously affected by the conflict in Gaza and Israel, in Ukraine, and in other areas of our world. We ask that you would stretch out your mighty hand to bring an end to these wars. We cry out for people who have been injured or traumatized, who have lost loved ones or their homes. 
Please provide what they need and be their comfort, their hope, their healer and their safe refuge. We pray that the powerful and the decision makers would follow paths of justice and mercy. We pray for your peace to reign. We look to you as our saviour and the hope of the world. Amen. Amen. I'm going to continue with our series on Joseph and today our reading is from Genesis 45 verses 1 to 11 and then 19 to 24. So if you've not been here, there's been uh, a number of interactions between Joseph and his brothers. His brothers aren't aware of who he is. He's very aware of who they are. And then we get to this very dramatic point in the story. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, This is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord over all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you here because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And then dropping down from verse 19. You are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father and come. Never mind about your belongings, because the best of all Egypt will be yours. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh had commanded, and he also gave them provisions for their journey. To each of them he gave new clothing, but to Benjamin, Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt, Ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away. And as they were leaving, he said to them, Don't quarrel on the way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray for Norman and for ourselves as he comes to speak. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this incredible story of Joseph. We thank you for what you've been speaking to us about through this man and through his character and the way he walked with you. Lord, we pray that as we dip in again to the story that your Holy Spirit would be at work in and through Norman and that you would speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Ross, as you notice at the end of the prayer, I had the things switched on this morning. We've been looking at the story of Joseph for weeks now, and it's a brilliant story. It's one of these magnificent stories in the Bible, of which there are many. It's one of the longest in the Bible, certainly Old Testament-wise, it's one of the longest in the Bible. 
It's a great story with much biblical truth and biblical reality in it. There's much biblical challenge to us and each and every one of us. But it's unique in many ways in that the hand of God's at work in Joseph's life at a huge depth, in a huge complex way and making things difficult at some times, making things good and bringing miracles to happen along the way. The story so far is that Joseph has been in prison for a couple of years uh, and in prison not because he's a, cr a criminal but because of false accusations and he's been involved in many ways with the whole business of famine in the land because through dreams God speaks to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and speaks to Egypt as a whole about the way forward, about the way through, about the way to reconciliation, about the way to peace, about the way to get delivered from famine particularly, because famine was going to destroy the whole of the Middle East at that particular time, and Joseph's predictions and Joseph's uh, revelations from, from, from God to Joseph. Joseph knew that God had spoken to the whole nation that seven years of famine were going to hit the land. Two years had already passed and five years still remained. And this is where we come into the story now. Joseph's brothers, sons of, Ju sons of Jacob, had come down to Egypt to meet with Joseph to buy grain for the... Joseph was the, the man who was organising the grain collection to buy grain for the food to deal with the famine. And there's been interactions between Joseph and his brothers. Joseph knows who they are by revelation, by just understanding. They haven't a clue who Joseph is. All they see is an Egyptian politician, an Egyptian powerful man, and they're terrified a bit of him. But we come to this situation where the brothers and Joseph are in a room by themselves. Joseph has chased out all the Egyptian servants. And this room is a room that suddenly becomes a noisy place. I don't know if you've ever heard, or if you have thin walls in your house and you hear people around next door to you. Not, not our neighbours are, we never rouse and couldn't hear anything. If you hear neighbours around next door to you, sometimes they're singing or shouting at a football match or something like that, but sometimes it's just, not my present neighbours, it's just that they're, basically they're around. There's a row going on next door. And you mightn't hear every word of it, but you hear a lot of it. And that's where we're at. There's a row happens in this room that Joseph's in. But it's not the brothers, the ten brothers who at this stage are causing the trouble. It's Joseph. Then Joseph could no longer control himself, writes the Bible, says the Bible. Joseph could no longer control himself before his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there's no one when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly. Joseph breaks into a, a real wailing and a real crying and a real mourning and a real cry of pain that comes out in all kinds of ways. But it's loud and it's terrifying for the brothers because they don't know who it is they didn't expect an Egyptian prince as he, he was in some ways they wouldn't have expected him this powerful man to burst out in tears so he, he makes sure there's nobody there except his brothers and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it and then Joseph has an emotional outburst a, a real breaking down in a strong way but a real breaking down in a powerful way but still a a real breaking down, an emotional terrifying, an emotional outburst. And he shouts out in many senses, I am Joseph. Is my father, that's Jacob, is my father still living? The last thing they expected to hear was Jacob, Joseph speak in this kind of way. The last thing they expected was to hear this prince of Egypt, this powerful man, break down into their eye, before their eyes, and ask them question, is my father, Joseph, is my father still living? His brothers were not able to answer him because they were just terrified at his presence. They were struck dumb. They were struck speechless. Probably their knees were knocking. But it's Joseph that's causing the trouble. But it's Joseph who's causing the trouble because his heart's breaking. His heart's breaking with compassion for these brothers. His heart's breaking with the loss of the relationship that he's had with his father for years. It all comes out. It all comes out, and it's a fear on these men. A fear you can understand, it, couldn't you? Just a fear that grabs them, and a fear that gets their hearts and minds and souls, shakes them up to big time. They weren't even able to answer him because they were so distressed, terrified by his presence. 
a fear provoked by Joseph's presence and by Joseph's words. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. And he brings them over and draws them close. And then he begins to tell them the story. They haven't a clue what's going on. They haven't the foggiest idea. That they haven't even, they, they're not able to ask Joseph any questions. They're struck dumb. But Joseph says to his brothers, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Can you imagine being there? Can you imagine the fear that would be in your heart and mind and soul? Can you imagine basically that this just doesn't compute? Their minds are blown by it. It just doesn't happen this kind of way. But it is happening. And a story is unfolding here. Now the story we've looked at for a bit of time and I've already said at the start of, this, start of the story. Joseph begins to explain to them what God is doing here. This is God at work in this situation. Not just a politician like Joseph. Not just the brothers in their need and ordinary people like them. But basically there's a great need here for the story to be told and the story to be heeded and the story to be learned. And Joseph tells it and spills it out. We're not going into it now. We've done it in many senses leading up to now. And it continues into the couple of chapters afterwards. But Joseph tells the story of what's happening. And it's not Jacob and Joseph's story. Not even Jacob and his, son and his son's story. It's God's story. His story. It's history. His story. That's what much of the Old Testament narrative is like. The narrative, passage, the narrative books like Genesis and others in the Old Testament. They're telling us God's story. His story. God at work. He explains to them that two, near, two years now there's been famine in the land and for the next five years there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. God at work. So a great little phrase here in verse 7 of this passage is, as Joseph expounds God's story. He says this, there's a lot going on, there's been famine in the land, next five years there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me, but God. The situation looks hopeless. The situation in five year, more years of famine looks hopeless. The situation looks dire, difficult, distressing. The situation in which they have been caught up, which Sonia and, and Ross both have spoken about over the last couple of weeks, with Joseph playing, not political games with these guys to try and break open the hard shells, but with Joseph trying to bring about some way of getting to talk to these men and engage with these men. But Joseph needs God to help him. In fact, God uses Joseph to let his story be told. But God sent me ahead of you. But God sent me ahead of you. They've been evil. They've treated Joel, Joseph appallingly. They abused him as a young boy. They sent him away to be bought by Ishmaelites coming to Egypt to become a slave. They treated him abominably. But Joseph makes it clear. For the next two years, there'll be, no there'll be famine in the land, and the next five years, there'll be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. But God, there's always a but God in Bible stories. It's a wonderful thing to find that but God. This is what's happening here. This is what people are doing. But God delivers. God intervenes. God steps in. God is able. And this is turned from just history to his story as God delivers and rescues. The next verse says it again. So then it was not you. This is a tremendous statement to make by Joseph. Joseph says to these brothers, but then, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. What an incredible thing to say. It was them who sent him there. They sold him to the Ishmaelites. They just tossed him away and didn't care to hoots about him. They were evil in their actions. They should never, ever, ever have done what they did to Joseph. There was abuse in abundance. They were not, in any sense, anything good about their actions. And yet here they are in the situation where they're speaking about deliverance. And Joseph is making this plain. This is God's work. But God, but God has intervened here. But God 
has made me a, pharaoh, a father to the Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. It's time for action now. Joseph is going to send them back to his father up in, in, in Israel. God is going to send his father, he was called to Israel, Jacob. His father was going to be brought into the story now. They've done evil to Joseph to bring him to this point, but God planned it all. God brought it all to pass. God rescues, God redeems, God saves his people. But God stepped in here. And that's where Joseph found his hope. And all the years in Egypt, and the years in imprisonment for false accusations, and all the awful things that happened to him, evil was happening to him. But could you, you, Joseph could see beyond that and through that and, that and above that. And God's at work here. And all these strange, strange things that Sonia and Ross were speaking about. It's worth reading those chapters. In fact, it's worth reading the chapters, the, the whole story of Joseph as a whole. That's what we should be doing at times like this. Reading them as a whole and getting the whole power of it all. But God. But God has a purpose in it all. All those games with uh, sacks of grain, with cups in the sack. With all those grain, by taking brothers like Simeon and wanting his brother Benjamin to be brought down to him. All those stories and all those actions were God at work. God was working through them. They were the works of human beings, but God was working beyond them and above them and below and beneath them. So the word gets out to Pharaoh. The Holy of Egypt begins to hear the news. The noise of a row, it wasn't really a row, but of a breakdown in the family relationships in Joseph's room begins to filter out and spread out like wildfire to the Pharaoh, to his peoples, to his soldiers, to his politicians, to his tribes. The word begins to spread out. And then Joseph begins to tell them the way forward as God reveals to him. And it's about relationships being restored before there's famine cared for, before there's grain given to them. Relationships need to be restored. These men have been feuding amongst themselves, probably since the day and before it, maybe even, that they, took Joseph, they, they captured Joseph, threw him in the pit, and then dragged him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites. These men have been feuding amongst themselves. They're Jacob's sons, and they're manipulative. They're angry. They're trying to get one over one another. One another. They're just ordinary men doing different, difficult, bad things. It's like a, the relationships in their, their whole family relationships for the last 22 years have been frozen. It's like an Arctic ice sheet, frozen. But now the moment has arrived where the ice, ice sheet begins to break up and breaks begin to give the way forward an opportunity. And there's noise when that happens. There's noise, like the noise in Joseph's in Joseph's, in Joseph's room, the noise of Joseph's, Joseph's heart breaking. His heart's breaking just as the relationships are beginning to open up all around him. So the time to move forward has arrived. So you have to jump big bits here. Very, there's so much of this in the Bible and so much of this story. But big things begin to happen now. The relationships are beginning to open up. There's the possibility of being brought together again. It's possibly of sorting out their relationships at this moment. Their relationships with Joseph can be restored because Joseph's working towards that. And there's time now for a reunion to happen in the family. And that reunion's going to involve them going back to, going back to Canaan, going back to their father Israel. This was their father's name, Jacob. To go back to Israel, to go back to Jacob and take the next step forward of healing in his family. And what a generosity Joseph shows to them. Rather than being angry with them, rather than being difficult with them, rather than them basically wanting to do Joseph down again, Joseph begins to make plans of generosity. This is all about grace, this story. And grace is all about generosity. God's grace is abundant grace, amazing grace. And it's all about God being generous to the extreme 
being generous to people who don't deserve generosity, being generous to people who have walked away from him, being generous to people who have abused his people, being generous to people who basically uh, turned their back on God and would do harm to God and to God's people if they could. The situation is a situation of difficulty. There's no plain way forward until God reveals it to Joseph. But God intervenes. And God intervenes with generosity. And God intervenes with grace. And it's not a matter of trying to get one over one another. It's not a matter of people trying to get their hands on other people's treasures, in a sense, through this process. It's a process of reconciliation happening among the family. They're a fighting family. You see that about the stories of Joseph and his sons. They're a fighting family, and even at the end of the story here, as Joseph gives them the opportunity to go back home again, says, don't go home fighting amongst yourselves. Don't fight amongst yourselves. They were fighting amongst themselves, probably, from the time they took Joseph captive and threw him in the pit. A deep, 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 deep division. A painful relationship. But this is the moment for those relationships to be opened up again. And as grace and generosity, displayed by Joseph towards them, displayed to God, to Joseph, by God himself, who looks after Joseph. The whole thing about grain and cups of silver cups and big meals that they're all sat down to, it's all about generosity. Grace means generosity. Grace brings healing. Grace brings the way forward when difficult things are happening. And that's what we see here. And Joseph basically says to him, don't fight along the way. Don't quarrel along the way. Don't be a fighting family anymore. Heal those relationships amongst yourselves. And carry that healing back into Canaan, back into Jacob, and back into the place of Jacob's habitation. So they go home, at least without Joseph to do. They go home. And they told him, Joseph is still alive, as told her dad. Joseph is still alive. In fact, he's in of all Egypt. They were astounded. They were struck dumb. Can you imagine what Jacob was? They thought, he thought his son had died 22, 25 years ago, killed by a wild animal. Now, basically, he's told this story. It must have penetrated deep, deep, deep into his soul. When they saw him, when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. The generosity was providing what they needed to get back to Canaan with grain for them. But to get back to Canaan, to get hold of Jacob and persuade Jacob to come with them down to, his, down to Egypt. And they're going to move that, those miles, those countries, move from one nation to another, from one tribe to another. They're going to end up in Egypt for 400 years. 400 years to the times of Moses. The spirit of Jacob revived. The way opened up for him to receive grace. The way opened up for him to show grace. The way opened up for him to walk forward in grace and in reconciliation and in peace with his brothers, well, with his sons and in peace with Joseph. I'm convinced, he says, that my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. The spirit revived. The man was renewed. The story continues. And the story continues in grace and in God's great mighty power towards this man, Jacob, and his sons. There's always a sense that the fighting family amongst themselves, there's always a fighting family there. But there's a time for healing. It's not, this isn't about nations being healed. This is about families being healed. It's about relationships amongst their friends being healed. But when small things are healed, the ripples roll out. The ripples move back, move forward. And the ripples are ripples of grace that capture others along the way. And the story continues. And God's still at work. Much is to happen yet. All sorts of people are going to do all sorts of things. But God is at work. But God, nothing can stop his plans and purposes being fulfilled. 
Thank God for that. But let's just be practical here, practical ourselves. If we're, if we're living in a broken relationships within our family circle, amongst our friends, if we're living in a relationship of tension with our neighbours, remember God calls us to live in grace. Grace brings generosity. Generosity brings steps forward, revival. Like Joseph, like Jacob, brother, the spirit of their father, Jacob, whereby grace, generosity brings revival. Let's throw ourselves in God. Let's allow God to work mighty things in our lives. And let's see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, as ultimately the one to whom we go with all our needs, and all our troubles, and all our brokenness, and all our anger. And see Jesus stepping in our lives and walking forward into our situations and bringing peace to pass. But God, no matter what else has happened to you, you're here today, but God has brought you here. And God has a plan and purpose for your life. God has a plan and purpose for all our lives. God has a plan and purpose for this church in the future. Let it be that we follow him in the steps of grace. Let's pray. Lord, into our brokenness, we ask you to step in your grace. Into our poverty of spirit, we ask you to revive and renew us. Into our relationships, we pray the oil of healing. And may we recognize it and through it all that you're God at work and follow your footsteps always. Thanks, Norman. You've inspired me someday to do a sermon series on those words, but God, because they're throughout Scripture and they're amazing, amazing words. Here come the rowdies. Welcome back. Lovely little hats on today. Beautiful. Before our closing hymn and prayer, just a few notices, but uh, there are significant notices today. So even though the kids are really cute do tune in as well so that you're looking at them and also listening to the different notices. Uh, on the way out you'll get an uh, eco news update. Do have a read at those, you know those are produced so that we read them through and uh, so that it inspires us to, to, to do more. So do have a wee read of those. It's very hard not just to watch them as they come in isn't it? Norman are you turned off? Are you turned off? Lovely. So do uh, read this when you get home. Also, though, on your way out today, you're going to receive two of these little leaflets. On one side of the leaflet is notification of our Christmas fair, which is on Saturday, 2nd of December. And on the other side of the leaflet is um, our services over Christmas. You'll receive two. One is for your fridge or for wherever you keep yourself jammed up and stuff. And the other is for you to give to someone to invite them to come along to our fair and to our Christmas services. So can you do that? Uh, can you pick one up for yourself, but also give one away and say to a friend, come along to these events? Norman and Rosemary, I wonder if you could both come down at the end so that you can, there's too many things for one person to give out. Maybe you could share the load between you because you're the dream team. That would be fantastic. Could you also bring a little pen because someone's borrowed the pen that was on this sweet table? On this table, there are a couple of sheets. One is if you would like to donate something to the Christmas fair, and there's various things that we're looking for to make that happen. And the second sheet is if you would be uh, willing to get involved in the day, either uh, as part of the kitchen team or manning a stand, part of the welcome team. We need all hands on deck. So do have a read and decide what you can do. Can I ask you please that you all get involved? You may not all be able to be there, but we can all do something to make the Christmas fair happen and for it to be all it can be. So how do we read, see what you can do and do sign up for that. Um, I'll not go through that, we went through that last week. I'll, I'll come back to that. Bells, there is an event on Saturday from two to four in the Kennedy rooms. I'm a Philistine, I had to look out up the word decoupage. 
But decoupage is going to be uh, uh, presented to the ladies by Joanne Brown, her own Joanne Brown. And uh, it sounds like a, a, a really interesting afternoon. I should go and get educated. It's five pounds. Its refreshments are included. If you would like to go and you have five pounds, could you give your five pounds to Gwen today? If not, and you would still like to come, I'm sure you can come along in the day and bring five pounds with you. But uh, decoupage, am I even pronouncing that right? Yes. Yeah, thanks Joanne, looking for you, you're the expert. Decoupage, this Saturday, two to four Kennedy rooms. Then show us what you produce and I'll be educated, that'll be fantastic. Uh, remembrance service on Sunday, November the 12th is combined with our organizations. Um, I think it's important that we find a way of presenting this really important day to all ages and sometimes we're not so good at that. So that service is going to feel a little bit different but it will also have within it the act of remembrance and the solemnity of that. But the rest of the service will be more geared to all ages so that all ages can engage with these important themes. So that's Sunday, November the 12th, a wee bit of a different remembrance service for all ages. Um, please do come along, young and old. Christmas Fair, by the way, is only 34 days to go, so do have a wee look and sign up today uh, with how you can get involved and have a think about how you can get involved in the next very near future. All right, let's stand for our closing song, which reminds us that this, these ripples of grace, these ripples of love come from God. We're going to sing love divine, all love's excelling. So let's sing out together.
Let's pray together. Neither death, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. There's prayer if you would like prayer just over to your left in front of the pulpit. Uh, there is coffee at the back so you could have a little bit of a coffee and a chat. God bless you. See you soon.